Welcome to the to the webinar uh, principles of extrapolation and screening of loss profiles. Just want to give a, a quick overview of, of our discussions this afternoon. Um, firstly, looking at uh, velocity profile principles, um, velocity distribution and the theory around that. And how velocity or roughness coefficients or roughness, channel roughness itself can impact the velocity distribution. Then we will have a look at acoustic Doppler principles, um, which is basically the same for most of the uh, acoustic Doppler instruments available on the market. Uh, what type of methods is available for extrapolation and it's currently implemented in the software. Uh, implementation in the different software packages and some key examples um, just to give you some background on the topic. Um, screening of velocity profiles, that is a, a key important thing. Um, highlighting some of the research that's been done over the past decade. Uh, what USGS policies has been implemented to date with regard to that? Um, and then also the implementation of, of, of the screening um, in the various software packages. So although the, the, most of the presentation or this or webinar today would be focused towards uh, Sontex, River Survey, M9 and S5 instruments, um, this webinar is applicable to all acoustic Doppler current profilers currently on the market, especially with the focus to velocity extrapolation and screening of velocity profiles. So if we look at the typical velocity distribution curve supplied by Chow, Vinter Chow, for equal velocity, we will see that the velocity distribution is related to the geometry or shape of the channel, the roughness of the channel itself, and the presence of bends in the channel. So based on theory, if the the maximum velocity would occur 0.05 to 0.25 of the depth if the if the channel or banks are very close and this is specifically in channels with a, that that is very narrow and a deep channel such as in this triangular trapezoidal or narrow rectangular channels and even on a pipe if the channel or section is broad and there is rapid and shallow flow present or the channel has smooth um, sides, the velocity or maximum velocity would occur at the, occur at the surface, such in a shallow ditch and natural channel. Right, banks do not have any impact on the central velocity region if the width is greater than five to 10 times the depth of the flow, depending on the surface roughness. So if we have an aspect ratio of between five and 10, the velocity should be expected to be at the surface based on the current theory. Um, anything less than that, depending on the surface roughness, could result in a surface velocity uh, or maximum velocity occurring below the surface. There's only two uh, theoretical reasons uh, or explanations for that to occur is, as I said, the aspect ratio. And then secondly, if you have wind blowing upstream. So if we look at the relationship between the roughness or relative roughness and the velocity and, the, and the velocity distribution from rows, we will see that the smaller the, the roughness, the smaller the exponent for the velocity profile. And that can give you indication as well as is when you do the measurements and do it perform extrapolation and you are working with a small exponent, then that is directly related to uh, the roughness in the channel itself. If the relative um, roughness is um, has a larger value, then that will also increase the exponent value.
So just a quick overview of the acoustic Doppler principles um, that we have. And again, this is applicable to, to all acoustic Doppler instruments on the market. Um, you know, the current, uh, most in instruments um, as a different frequency range that's used um, and a range between three megahertz to around 250 kilohertz is your traditional type of instruments used in hydrographic operations for discharge measurements. Most of these instruments are equipped with four beams uh, to perform uh, discharge measurements uh, in both the X and Y velocity components. The system is making use of monostatic uh, transducers, which means that the same transducer is transmitting the signal, is also receiving the signal. And when, when a signal is transmitted, when the transducer or that uh, transmission is stopped, there's a ringing effect occurring on the transducer itself. And that can impact the measurements, velocity measurements. And, and for that reason, a blanking distance is incorporated, automated blanking distance is incorporated in the firmware to exclude that zone below the transducers or transducer face. Along the transducer itself, a number of cells are set either by using an automated process or manual configuration. Uh, so the cell size can be either automated um, or manual. And then using a process called time gating, we can determine the distance along the beams with the cells and then measure the velocities for each cell as well as the total depth. So with a ADCP measurements in both moving boat and stationary methods, there is certain area that can be measured. And in this uh, cross-sectional area is called the, the measured area. And then there's also the unmeasured area, which consists of the edges, a top and a bottom estimates. The, the edges are basically limited to the minimum depth the acoustic Doppler instrument can measure in. And the International standards requirement for edge measurements is where you are able to collect uh, a depth where you have two valid cells. And then 10 samples or ensembles is, 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 is measured at that specific location, and that is averaged to extrapolate towards the, ed the water edge. The top edge estimate is basically consists of the instrument drop or depth plus the blanking distance. That's the portion we can't measure, and that will be estimated. And then a bottom estimate is default in the river survey life is 10% cutoff, and that is to prevent any side lobe interference from uh, um, impacting the, the actual measurements itself. This is a more close up view of, of those two top and bottom zones. As you can see there, that's your transducer depth and your blanking distance, and that is the area that we can that we're not able to measure and will be determined by the extrapolation method. The bottom portion, as I mentioned previously, is the area where side lip interference can occur. Um, and for this reason, Sontek has a default value of 10% to cut off. And the main reason for this is when, it's, when a signal is transmitted, there's side lobes associated with, with the main beam itself. And if the side lobe is reflected from a hard surface, either from the channel bottom or object, it can have the same strength in the reflection as the main lobe. And the software and firmware won't be able to, to differentiate between the two. So for that reason, we will we implement a cutoff of 10% to make sure that there's no side lobe data incorporated in the main data set. I just want to highlight this. This is also applicable to all site looking instruments and up looking instruments where we have a cutoff, uh, the last 10% of the, of the data collection we don't use at all for any uh, flow measurements or calculations. The extrapolation method is currently implemented in River Survey Alive, and that is also available in, in, in all, the other, uh, in all the other manufacturers, software, as well as the USGS consists of uh, a top, a power uh, function, constant and free point methods, and at the bottom, a power and no slip. 
So in the river survey life, the default extrapolation method is a power to power for 1.6 power law. So it's 0 0.16667 uh, exponent. Um, and this just gives you an indication of the, of the three different methods. Um, a constant means that we are using the top cell and extrapolate that vertically to the water surface. A no slip is based on the assumption that the velocity at the boundary layer is zero. And then a three point method, a three point no slip method, again, no slip is assumed that the velocity at the boundary layer is zero. And we extrapolate, we perform a linear extrapolation using the top three cells to the water surface itself. So the extrapolation methods implemented um, that's going to be discussed here consists mainly of the USCS software package and MATLAB software that's supplied and River Survey Live. So if we look at River Survey Live, it's fairly basic. It's just an entry form using a top extrapolation. So the, so the user has the, the option to select what type of method is is, is, is opted for that extrapolation portion and the coefficient or exponent, and the same with the bottom extrapolation. Here you will see a 10% profile uh, for the for the bottom uh, for the scart the last 10%, and I would highly recommend that you leave these the 10% value as default. If we look at extrap, which was one of the first MATLAB software packages USGS developed for extrapolation, it uses a display the, the, the data collected graphically for the extrapolation process. Um, so for, for you to be able to use Extrap, you will need to perform MATLAB export from River Surveyor Live. You can either do it manually or we've made changes in the last version, I think from version 4.0, where you can set to perform that automatically. Um, so as soon as you completed the transect or uh, a loop or SMBA file, a MATLAB file will be created autom automatically. A normalized distance uh, from the stream bed, a normalized unit Q is developed from the MATLAB file and displayed in the graphical representation here. Then what Extrap will do is, is perform an automatic fit based on the best option statistically from the data supplied. And that will be highlighted in the reference, as you can see in this image here. It will also supply a percentage difference of the other extrapolation methods compared to the discharge based on the power-to-power -power, uh, uh, automated selection. If you are unsatisfied with the selection, you can um, change the automatic to manual and then enter user-defined uh, method and ex exponents. It is also important to note that it's using the entire measurement, which is basically the two transects combined. Uh, you can manually process each transect on its own. In case of extrap, the default will be is to use the entire measurement section combined. The latest software, QREF, which is not that new, it's been out a, a couple of years, is, is a, also based on MATLAB and it also requires MATLAB exports from River Survey Live to operate. It's a bit more, it supply a bit more information um, on the display itself and statistical um, information that you can display in the graphical representation of it. This portion works exactly the same as Extrap. It will also perform an automated uh, extrapolation based on the best fit of the data that was supplied. And in this case, it supplied a power to power with a 0.1485 reference. And again, calculating uh, the difference of percentage if you use another method, extrapolation method. And in this case, if we would have used uh, the default value or default extrapolation values in the River Survey Live, it would have resulted in a plus a minus 0.4% of the total discharge. So if we look at a couple of case studies, 
and that's why it's so important um, that at least with for other graphers that you need to analyze or at least verify your measurement sites uh, during certain flow conditions. Um, it, it's your organizational operations and requirements that will dictate if you are required to use QREF or not. I know there's a lot of organizations that, that does require it nowadays, but there's also organizations that prefer just to use the manufacturer supplied software. And I just want to highlight some of the some of the the case studies that we've seen before. Um, this is one this is in the Mississippi at Baton Rouge. And although we seldom get or even have flows of this magnitude um, in Australia, we do have, most of our catchments do generate large floods where we have from almost a trickle or very low velocities or flows to extreme velocities. So those extremes, we are very used to in Australia, and that's the thing that I want to highlight in this example. So in this case at Baton Rouge, it was almost 42,000 cubic meters per second that was flowing in, in, during the flood event. And if we look at your default power to power of 0.1667 exponent, you will see that we there would there's a difference of almost two percent in discharge which is relatively large if you take into account there's a number of other factors that will also impact the accuracy of the measurement. So if you add 2% on top of everything else that's, that's impacting the accuracy, then obviously that will uh, further exaggerate the, 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 the variance in the measurements. If we look at the same site during normal flows, which is around 8,200 8, 8, cubic meters per second, you will see that the exponent has changed from the one we've noticed during the flood event. So the important thing to notice here is that although both were off from the from the, your default settings in the rivers of our life, your exponent, the extrapolation exponent from low flows to high flows is definitely going to change. And that's something you need to investigate to at least verify um, at your measurement site to make sure you are you have the correct approach. The next case study is at an irrigation canal in Yuma um, in the USA. Um, the total flows is around 35 or just over 34 cubic meters a second. Um, you know this is a type of setup that you will get any anywhere in the world. It's not only applicable to certain areas. They've constructed an artificial gauging where in this, in this vicinity here, you will see that there's a divergent canal that was constructed around this. So during the construction, they installed a coffer dam in this vicinity here to divert the water around it to do the actual construction work. During a survey, we noticed that there were some abnormalities in the in the velocity distribution in the channel, as well as the velocity or exponent is not your standard power to power 0.1667, where you would think fairly long straight channel irrigation, uniform channel shape should be very close to that. So we performed a bathymetry survey of the channel itself and you can see in this vicinity here, on this region, that the channel bed is shallower than the rest of the channel. And this is where the, where the actual coffer dam was located. So what happened was when they finished the construction, they didn't remove the coffer dam entirely. And there was a portion left at the bottom. So during the bathymetry survey using Ara Surveyor, we also performed velocity measurements. So this is a velocity contour plot um, in the channel itself. So here you can see that there's the velocity distribution upstream of, of this, and then you get an acceleration across where the, the shallow portion is or where the actual coffer dam was located. Then you get a, a, a reduction in velocity and even uh, very slow negative velocities on the edges uh, due to the deeper pool that occur that's present downstream of it. And then again, an acceleration right at the, at the uh, notch of the gauging wear. 
So if we look here, you will see um, the default extract method or extrapolation method selected by QRF uh, was constant no slip with a 0 0.1075 exponent. And that your default value of power to power um, at a 0.6% difference um, from the from the reference flow. There are two factors impacting this, this specific site, and which is very common with, with a lot of irrigation sites, is there's upstream, um, the actual control upstream created by the by the by the coffer dam that wasn't removed. So there's an acceleration of the of the flow there, as well as during peak releases, this gauging web submerged in almost 100 percent So your velocity distributions change depending on the flow releases in the channel. So it is important to especially at this specific channel to verify the extrapolation almost with every single uh, measurement exercise to make sure that the, right, that the correct extrapolation is applied. So if we look at research work done over the last decade or more um, on the screening of velocity profiles, um, the first work was identified by Gartner and Ganju in 2002 when they performed measurements with acoustic Doppler instruments um, to verify if it was feasible to measure much shallower and much shallower conditions. So as I mentioned previously, uh, most acoustic Doppler instruments making use of a blanking distance to remove the data set associated with that ringing effect from the transducers, as that will impact um, the data quality itself. And as the technology and, and improved and further development was done on transducers and acoustic Doppler instruments, um, that portion was investigated as well, where it is now feasible to measure much closer to the transducers itself from the standard 25 centimeters when acoustic instruments was brought out to nowadays you can measure up to three centimeters away from the from the transducers so what they've done was performing field measurements using a uh, rio grande z um, in the field and then comparing those results or measurements against um, argonaut adv at the same region from the from the instrument itself so focusing on that uh, zero to 25 centimeters from the transducer phase, that zone was targeted with uh, ADV measurements to verify if, um, if those measurements are performed accurately enough. From the measurement results, it was identified that there was a negative bias measured in velocities near the transducer phase. And that the impact on the data quality appears to be a physical presence of the transducer itself. So if you can visualize yourself, there's something in, in a water body and there's water flowing um, towards the instrument itself. Some of the water is flowing around it and some of the water is flowing right into the instrument and then falls down underneath it. And as a result of that, that uh, flow distribution around and underneath the instrument that can cause impact on the actual measurements itself. And then based on their uh, research at that time was that the recommended depth uh, or blanking distance uh, space specifically for the Rio Grande should be around 25 centimeters for the 1200. Uh, a further research was done by Dave Mueller et al. Um, in 2007. Errors um, in acoustic Doppler profile of velocity measurements caused by flow disturbance. So what they've done here was just to use to, to relook at the data that was collected by Gardner and Gonyu um, that was done in 2002. And then also uh, developing a computational fluid dynamic model um, or CFD um, with the actual instruments uh, incorporated in the model itself. They were using Argonaut or ADV instrument uh, as well as PIV techniques 
uh, to collect data in the in the laboratory to to verify uh, the model calibrations and to to make sure that that the actual measurement results is comparable with the CFD model. So in this case, you will see a velocity percentage difference in velocity if there was no instrument in the water versus with the instrument itself. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you can see around um, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 meters away from the instrument, you see a one percent error um, of the velocity itself and then as you go further away that percentage gets lesser and lesser the closer you get to the instrument the more drastic that impact is uh, <clears throat> by the time of this research Sontec ADP was was analyzed um, and you will see here uh, the graphic of the representation is the acoustic mode uh, the solid line represented on this side is the actual acoustic Doppler current profile measurements or the measurements performed by the Sontec ADP. Um, and then the, the dotted or dashed line on the right hand side is the actual measurements that was uh, developed from uh, both the ADV measurements as well as the CFD model. And then the center line here is your undisturbed measurements, meaning there was nothing in the in the model or there was nothing in the channel when that uh, measurements were performed and this will give you a percentage error bar um, at a certain depth away from the instrument to determine what impact that have on the on the actual uh, velocity measurements the same process was was performed on the rio grande z um, again the adcp portion the undisturbed velocities uh, measured, and then the actual measurements from CFD and uh, ADV and PIB measurements. Then in 2010, research was done by Marian Mustang, uh, Don Su King, and Juan Castro um, on the same principles. A Rio Grande Z8 was used in the research, and here's a, maybe a more exp explanatory uh, graphics to show you what was actually done. And this is a similar process that was done by Mueller et al. in 2007 as well. This is a velocity profile where there's no instrument uh, in the water itself. Then the, when the instrument is installed, so this is a velocity profile and conditions that occur actually during the measurement. So these velocities are measured using a, a Sontec micro ADV during the tests. And then this is the results from the acoustic Doppler instrument itself. So if we look here again, similar representation of the data sets, this portion of the data shows you the actual velocity measured by the um, acoustic Doppler instrument. This is the portion of the data that is uh, highlights uh, undisturbed zone or where there's no instrument installed. And then this is actually measured using an ADV to, to show you the impact of the instrument in the water itself. Dave Mueller then uh, in 2015 did further work on um, a bigger range of instruments. Because uh, uh, as you can see from 2010, there was a number of instruments, um, or 2007, there was a number of instruments um, released by different manufacturers. And from his, from his research itself, there was a number of improvements to IDC transducers and as I said most transducers can now some of the transducer instruments can measure up to five centimeters from the transducer face. Uh, field observations also show the trend for low bias near the transducers. An additional field investigation suggests that, that there is a disturbed flow field um, around the instrument itself due to the instrument. 
um, CFD model uh, was developed um, during 2015 as well on, on a number of instruments to verify the impact of flow on the on the major on the region just below the instrument itself and from that simulation the results indicated that two adcps the rio grande 1200 z8 and the river survey in, um, m9 would allow direct collection near transducer that were biased more than one percent So from the from the research done by the USGS, the following basically is now applied within their software, um, and they've also requested that to the, the manufacturers themselves. Um, so just a quick overview, and this this information is available in all the research papers and um, USGS documentations. Um, with the Stream Pro. Using the smallest blanking, uh, blanking distance and cell size show no bias due to the diameter of the transducer. So again, if we come back to the why um, the flow disturbance occurs around the transducer is firstly associated with the size of the transducer. The larger the transducer, the bigger the impact, the smaller the transducer, the lesser or no impact there is. Um, Rio Grande and River Pro all have default 25 centimeter blanking distances. So from the research done more than a decade ago, it was identified that at least 25 centimeters is required. Rio Pro, the minimum is 25 centimeters, which is not implemented based on the USGS website. And that is accommodate for in uh, QRF. Rubber Eye has an auto adaptive uh, blanking distance process and the center bin is always 25. The location of the scent of the first bin is always 25 centimeters from a transducer. So that puts it outside the 1% um, um, error on velocities. Uh, River survey is five. The smallest blanking distance is five centimeter. And again, this is similar to the Stream Pro. The smallest blanking distance and bin size showed no bias due to the diameter of the transducer. So River survey is five is not impacted with, with any flow disturbance at all. River survey M9, uh, one megahertz is using a default of 16 centimeters, and that is programmed in the firmware. And that's also the distance that the HGS recommend the minimum blanking distance should be for the M9. And then with the three megahertz, um, the minimum is recommended as 16 centimeters. This is not implemented. Uh, the minimum blanking distance applied is, use, is done using a screening distance. Um, the reason why Sontech hasn't implemented that, this into the blanking distance is mainly because some customers or users, especially in Europe, request that they still want to see that data and they don't want it to be excluded default uh, based on the 16 centimeter uh, screening distance. So the screening distance in the River Survey Live and QRF consists of two components. It's the water surface, it's a distance measured from the water surface to the bottom of the blanking distance. So in this case, it's the instrument depth of draft and then the recommended blanking distance for River Survey Live for both the three megahertz and one megahertz by the USGS is 16 centimeters. So you will see when you in smart page that there will be a value if you add the 16 centimeters to the to the to the depth of the instrument you will get to the same value in the river survey live so from the research itself facts um, using adcp instruments um, with monostatic transducers that sends um, and receive the the uh, that sends and receive the signal using the same transducer. So that's a fact, and we know that uh, we require um, a blanking distance to remove the ringing effect um, created because of the the transmission of the signal through the transducers. 
So from the research that was done over the past decade or so, it was indicated that the ADC acoustic Doppler current profile body or housing is creating flow disturbance uh, on measurements that's performed very close to this transducer phase. So the actual body itself is impacting the flow patterns around the instrument and below it. And how to account for that is, is either increasing the minimum blanking distance in the firmware or applying a screening distance. Um, now, some organizations uh, choose to follow the USGS um, in this regard um, and in other aspects, but some organizations um, feel they need to make that choice um, for the site on the data set on their own. So currently what we've done with River Survey Live has two options, which I will get show later that the actual screenshots the one is where you can install the software without the screening distance implemented and the second option would be is to have that 16 centimeters as default implemented in the system uh, so that's an option you have right in the beginning when you install the software itself when you have installed it and you perform the measurement then you will see on your smart page on the system settings there is a transducer depth, which is user configurable. You enter there 0 0.10, and then a screening distance, which would be calculated. So if you're using the, the USGS uh, option, that screening distance will automatically be calculated, and it will always be 16 centimeters more than your transducer depth. So it's important that if you choose to use that, that I would recommend that you follow the USGS guidelines. Um, using your own screening distance um, raise questions because there's no research work that supports that. Um, you could either remove a portion of the issues seen or not. So I would recommend if you want to follow that, apply the USGS uh, recommended screening distance of 16 centimeters. QRF on its own process, reprocess data using the MATLAB file. And, then, and for, for that matter, also the TRDI data. So irrespective of what settings you make in River Survey Live or Win River 2, QRF will use the MATLAB file or the MMT file and reprocess all the data from the from start and apply the screening distance. So it is important that if you are going to use QRF in your operations, that you follow the same guide plants using River Survey Live. Um, while you are collecting raw data, you want your settings as close as possible to QRF uh, processes as well. Um, otherwise, you could go and collect data in shallow areas with River Survey Live, and then when you process it in QRF, QRF will filter the data out, and then it means it looks like it was too shallow for the instrument itself. So that is probably the most important aspect, is to make sure if you are using QRF, make sure River Survey Live is, is uh, uh, configured or in line with what QRF is going to do as well. This is the process to install the USCS version. So when you install it, there would be an option, the second window where you are requested, do you want to use the USCS version or not? And then you just follow the, the the steps required um, until it's installed. Um, it, there's an easy way to verify if it's installed. If you enter uh, instrument depth or uh, instrument draft in, the screening distance section will be automatically populated with 16 centimeters added to the instrument depth. With River Surveyor uh, live from the research data that was done over the past decade or so, um, showed that with river surveyor is a bit more complicated it has two different frequencies so it has uh, two different sets of blanking distances um, the one megahertz uh, has a default blanking distance of 16 centimeters so that's not affected and the cell sizes are also larger so there's more averaging occurring at, at, at in that zone uh, the three megahertz pulse coherent cell sizes are much smaller and the blanking distance are smaller so in certain flow conditions, uh, flow disturbance does impact the measurements. And 
the reason why the 16 centimeters was implemented because now it applies to both frequencies, not only one. This, this was the reference papers that was used for, for these discussions. Um, and you're welcome to, this is easily accept, uh, available on, on the internet. If you just type in the, the research paper names, um, or if you send me an email, I can, I will welcome to send you a copy of the, of the papers if you're interested. And thank you very much for, for attending the, the webinar. I trust you, you had some knowledge information out of this. Um, if there's any additional information or queries that you have about the discussion topics, please feel free to, to send us it through the GoToWebinar or um, you can send me an email directly to my email account as well. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Dan Daniel. Um, again, as Daniel said, we're now open the webinar to questions from the attendees and feel free to either type your question into the GoToWebinar interface uh, in the questions box, or as Daniel said, uh, you can contact him directly at his email address, which is currently on the screen. So Daniel, I'm not sure if you can see the first question, but I'll read it for you. It says, hi, Daniel, what is the best power coefficient to use in sites that do not have any benchmark references? The best power coefficients that doesn't have any benchmark references. Yeah, I'm not, I think we will handle that question um, offline, Michael. I'm not sure those two topics are related. All right, that's fine. So, Sanish, uh, and, and for anyone, if there's a question that's kind of overly technical or um, we, we're not able to answer it on this webinar, we will be contacting you directly and sharing the answer with you. Does anyone else have any questions for Daniel? All right, Daniel, next one. Did S5 blanking distance review in Mueller have the streamlined flow attachment to the bottom of the board? Yep, they've um, analyzed, that's one, one aspect that I didn't really focus on during this webinar is it's not only the actual instrument itself that's, that can cause uh, uh, impact on the flow distribution around um, or flow patterns around the instrument, but the platform as well. Um, from the research that was done to date, almost all the instruments, including the stream pro, showed a bigger influence on the velocity patterns around the instrument if it was implemented on its own, meaning there was no, it wasn't mounted on a board, it was mounted on a post that was where the instrument was placed in the water directly without uh, using a, a trimaran boat or other board to or, or what type of float. So that was the first obvious um, thing that came out of the research is that the instrument on its own seems to generate or impact the flow disturbance around the instrument more. Um, they did test the older boards with that um, ring around it. And I think that was one of the things that um, contributed um, with the with the larger instruments. With the S5, there's no data that from the research that suggests that any that the instrument or the platform uh, resulted in flow disturbance in that first 15, 16 centimeters. Okay, Daniel, thank you. And on that note, uh, here's another question. Does it work only in shallow depths? Uh, I would like to know whether the instruments work more than 3,000 meters. Um, all right, so these acoustic, acoustic Doppler current profile instruments, uh, ranging from, as I said, from 3 megahertz uh, to around 250 kilohertz, is your traditional instruments. Um, 
that's used. And I would almost say uh, 250 is a bit low. Uh, you seldom get organizations that have that and it's more used in, in rivers like the Amazon and, and deep channels. Um, mostly are used between three megahertz and 600 kilohertz and those instruments, um, depth range is up to a maximum of around 100 meters, depending on the flow conditions and sediment constant depending on the backscatter in the, in the water and the sediment concentration. So no, these instruments are not able to, to, to uh, have depth ranges of that kind. Daniel, if you use the USGS option in River Severe, does it detect if it's an uh, S5 or an M9 and set the blanking distances accordingly? Yes, uh, River Surveyor Live um, automatically detects um, if it's an M9 or S5, and based on that, will um, apply the, the screening distance. Just to make to, to, to confirm again that the um, the screening distance, irrespective of you use the USGS version or um, the standard version, you can. Um, if you use a standard version, you can go and type in the, the manual uh, distance as well. But it does detect that for the S5s and the same with QREF as well. And that information is populated in the MATLAB files and then trunk and then um, uh, available to QREF. So QREF knows automatically if this is S5 or M9. Okay, Daniel, is it preferable to have the S5 mounted flush? At the bottom of the hydro board, or is there a benefit in having it project 10 centimeters below? It, it depends on, and I'm, I'm going to speak here for uh, talk to with regard to all instruments. Um, it depends on what the flow conditions are. Um, if you have debris on the water surface, um, air bubbles, uh, even, uh, and I've seen in cases in the desert where this a lot of sand on the edges and the wind is blowing that we get dust, very fine sands lying on top of the water surface. Um, and that starts to accumulate on top of the transducers. Um, and that will definitely impact your measurements. So one way of finding out is, and we haven't discussed it in this webinar, is to look at your um, SNR profiles, signal to noise ratio that's displayed in real time. And if you see one of the beams one or two of the beams or even more separating from each other. So normally the SNR profiles should be closely matched. They're not going to be exactly the same. And depending on the profiling technique, if it's pulse coherent or incoherent, um, incoherent, a pulse coherent is a bit more noisy because it's smaller cell sizes. Incoherent is a bit more faulted because it's larger cell sizes. Um, but if one or two of the beams are moving away from the group, then you know you have beam separation and you will have to stop the measurement, clean the instrument to continue. If that still persists, then you, you will have to think about lowering the instrument. Um, River Survey Live does supply warnings in the QA box where it will tell you there's beam separation occurring. If that happens, you need to stop immediately and either clean the instrument or lower it deeper in the water. Thank you, Daniel. You've discussed that extrapol extrapolation near the surface. Uh, um, how has the research been conducted near the river or stream bottom? For example, sand versus rocks versus cobbled versus weeds or plants. Um, oh, there's a number of research papers in the, an acoustic. Uh, there's definitely will be research papers in that regard. Um, and I will have to have a look at through my own documentation or uh, contact some of the key uh, research organiz um, uh, organizations uh, to find it, but they will definitely be to look at extrapolation um, with relating to um, um, the roughness, uh, the channel bed roughness and, 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 and type of, of, of roughness on the channel bed itself. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Next, if we have greater water velocity, say greater than four meters per second, 
would the 16 centimeter blanking distance be sufficient or should we set a larger blanking distance based on observations at that time? No, the, the 16 centimeter blanking distance um, should be sufficient for that. Although saying that from all the research papers, again, irrespective of what instrument you're using, if you're using TRDI or Sontec or Nordtec, um, the instrument itself is causing as an impact on the flow patterns around the instrument and below it, as well as the platform you're using. And then something that I didn't made, mention was, is the approach velocity. And will they have an impact on that as well? Um, I think analyzing um, in those circumstances, what I would do is analyzing the, the uh, velocity profiles in XTRAP or QREF in detail before making a decision. I can't indicate to you that the 16 would be enough or not enough. What I would recommend is, is is perform an in-depth analysis using either XTRAP or QRF and look at the velocity profile. Um, if you see a bend back, that could be, but then again, you need to verify if there was no wind blowing upstream as well. Um, and the aspect ratio, if that is applicable or not. So there is certain factors that you need to um, evaluate before you make a decision. So it's very difficult to tell you, to give you a, a a single answer on this because you need to evaluate all the different factors involved. All right, and for extremely wide rivers, such as the Mahanandi in India, which has 3,000 meters, to, which is uh, 3,000 to 6,000 meters wide, how is it possible to take discharge remotely without a boat? Um, that's at the, with current technology, um, 3,000 meters. No, with current technology, if you're using these remote control boats, um, that's uh, available, that's using um, high um, range um, uh, Wi Fi, um, the Sontec uh, 2.4 um, um, Earth's radio um, is able to measure a couple of kilometers, maybe up to three or just over three kilometers over uh, open surface water, a body. Um, but then you said we with remote control boats and their limitations. So I think you, you are pushing the, the current technology available in the market doesn't accommodate for that at this stage. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I don't see any other questions on the list. We'll give a few more seconds for anyone who would like to ask a, a final question. Uh, just a reminder that all these questions and their answers will be, uh, a transcript will be created and included in the follow-up email together with a link to this webinar. Um, and uh, that'll be available to all registrants and of course, you can share that with any of your coworkers as well who could not attend this webinar. All right, Daniel, I'm not seeing any final questions coming in. So thank you very much for your time, sir. That was an extremely informative yeah. webinar. And uh, we look forward to your next presentation. And to all the registrants, thank you very much. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. And there is a uh, follow-up survey, online survey, that will be coming in. Feel free to leave your opinion on, this, on the webinar. It, it, that feedback really helps us to improve future webinars as we go along. Daniel, thank you very much. Mm. No, thank you very much for attending, and uh, we'll talk soon again. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.